The Simpsons Hit and Run is often cited as one of the greatest licensed games ever made. And if you've played this game for more than five minutes, it's easy to understand why. There's so much you can do in this game. Explore Springfield, partake in illegal street races, blow up a school bus, kick your wife, kick a kid, kick your kids. The freedom is unrivaled. GTA ain't got shit on this game. Unfortunately, however, as beloved as this game is, I don't think we'll be seeing a sequel to it anytime soon or a remake. But why is that? It's no secret that a sequel or remake's in high demand, and if games like the Crash, Spyro, or SpongeBob remakes can do well, surely a hit and run remake would print money. Well, I wish it were that simple. Developed by Radical Entertainment, Hit and Run began development shortly after the release of Road Rage in 2001. We don't talk about that game, it doesn't exist! Radical wanted this to be the ultimate Simpsons game by expanding upon Road Rage's driving mechanics, allowing the player to get out of their car and explore Springfield on foot, as well as making sure to gut everything that Sega could possibly sue them for. Simpsons writers, the voice cast, and even Matt Groening collaborated with Radical and Chris Mitchell to help craft the story and dialogue to enrich the Simpsons experience, giving the game a completely authentic touch. Sorry, bot. I can't serve booze to a miner. It ain't right. I'm here to buy fireworks. Oh, hell yeah. Hit and Run was originally going to be a direct sequel to Road Rage, as hinted at with some of the potential names for the game, such as The Simpsons 2 or Road Rage Part 2. However, as the game's scope grew, and with heavy inspiration from GTA 3, it quickly became its own thing. You can see the Road Rage models used in early screenshots and cutscenes, and Homer's Road Rage model appears when he's eating cheese. I think I'm blind. Some of the potential names for the project were pretty funny too, like a slightly better Simpsons game, or your colour belong to us, or the Simpsons drive around and kick things. But I assume they actually wanted this game to sell, so they thought up some other, better names, like The Simpsons Doing Donuts, The Simpsons Kicking Asphalt, and eventually The Simpsons Hit and Run. Upon release, the game was an instant hit with fans, with many of them claiming it to be the best Simpsons game ever made. And it got pretty favourable reviews from the normie crowd too. Radical immediately wanted to work on a sequel with many plans laid out for one, but Vivendi Universal, the publishers, didn't renew their licence for The Simpsons IP, meaning that all plans were unfortunately cancelled. Wankers! In 2005, Radical Entertainment was acquired by Vivendi, and then in 2008, Vivendi was then merged into Activision to create Activision Blizzard. That's a fucking yikes from me, mate. So why can't Activision at the very least port the game? Well, currently Satan holds the rights for the video game license for Simpsons video games. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say Satan? I meant EA! And the last Simpsons home console release was the Simpsons game back in 2007. 15 years ago! Now I have a very long history with Hit and Run. I've been playing it for nearly my entire existence, so I do have some... Nostalgia. <laughs> but as well as playing it nearly all my life, I've also been creating videos about Shah for well over 10 years at this point. I've started with showing off three funny things then moved on to Let's Plays. I've done covers of songs from the soundtrack, and if your opinion of me couldn't get any worse, I used to speedrun the game too. That's somewhat what we needed. <gasps> what? No! No! Probably misses his old glasses. I first got this game from a game station back in 2004 when I got my PS2 for Christmas. As soon as I got home, I immediately shoved that disc into my PS2 and was hooked instantaneously. As a massive fan of the show, I always wanted to explore Springfield and this game finally let me do that. And it let me kick people! Thanks, Radical! I spent hours roaming around Springfield, finding secrets, burning rubber in races, kicking people into orbit. You know, your usual day-to-day -day activities. I was in sheer amazement at how much fun I was already having with the game, and all no, I've done is enter my name. name! Everyone I've ever spoken to absolutely adores this game. I reckon I could run into some random person on the street and they'd know about it. Sir! Sir! Hey, can I ask you a question? Sure Have you ever played The Simpsons Hit and Run? The Simpsons Hit and Run? What the f*** is that? Okay, bad example, but if you look around online, it won't take you very long to find people that absolutely love this game. But why is that? There have been so many Simpsons games released, but what makes this one so special? What made this one click? Before I go into the game and why it's not going to have a numeric digit next to its name anytime soon, I'd like to ask, if there ever was a hit and run 2, what would you like to see in it? Personally, I'd like to play as Mo, with a shotgun. <laughs> Imagine that, just fucking like shooting all the NPCs. <laughs> Strange happenings are occurring in Springfield! Strange black vans and wasp cameras are cropping up everywhere, so it's up to the Simpsons family in a poo to find out what's going on. Starting the game up, a swarm of wasps engulf the sky. Seems someone must have let Plock loose again. Well boys, we did it! Obligatory Plock reference, thank you, thank you. One of them begins spying on the Simpsons family and immediately gets pimp slapped by Homer, and a curb stomp for good measure. And then he just goes to sleep like it was nothing!
Fair fucks, man, I can respect that. Upon waking up, Homer inspects some of the coins that the wasp expelled after its brutal death and ends up cashing in a commercial for the new Buzz Cola, which isn't poisonous to anybody! That we know of. After audibly nutting over the thought of it, he heads over to the Quickie Mart to grab some. Homer's first level is basically a day in the life episode. He drops off Lisa's school project, retrieves stolen goods for Ned, and murders Mr. Smithers to protect his oh so precious scorpions. My convertible. God damn! While at home, Homer notices a strange black van parked outside his house and begins to get paranoid, which Marge seems to find rather arousing. You're so sexy when you're paranoid. Where is the sexy footage? Before she can really get going though, Homer dashes outside to tail it. Leading him to Mr. Burns' mansion, he believes that the evil old monkey skeleton's behind it and plans to dig up dirt on him. Before he can though, Marge forces Homer to help her to destroy all the new copies of Burnstone 2, as he contains... <laughs> VIOLENCE! Ah, oh, VIOLENCE! I knew it was them! Even when it was the bears, I knew it was them! After that, Homer notices Smithers heading to warn Burns and races him there. When he gets to Burns' manor, Burns informs Homer that the black vans are actually just pizza vans and Homer is then promptly fired. What? They were only pizza vans? Level 1 isn't really a story-heavy level. It takes until around level 3 for the story to really start kicking off. But the seeds are planted here with the black vans. Level 1 mainly serves as a big tutorial level for you to mess around in. Even the newspaper points this out. And the majority of the missions are pretty fun too. My sister would strictly only play Petty Theft Homer, and I always enjoy the final race in Fight and the Furious. While exploring Springfield, you may run into Millhouse, Nelson, or Ralph, aka the Boys. They're hosting three variations of street races time trials, circuit races, and a straight A to B race. By winning all three, you'll win a new car, and more importantly, an opportunity to kick the shit out of Panny and Selma. Cars are pretty important in this game, as you'll be spending most of your time in one for this adventure. Each character has their own car, even the kids, and you can get more from buying them from people around Springfield, or earning them from races or bonus missions. If you're in desperate need of a new ride, and don't mind paying in back robes, you can use one of the many phone booths to get one delivered. I doubt you'll get one quickly though, as you'll be too busy vibing to the sweet phone line music. You can also just mind jack one of the many NPC cars and force them to drive into the local river. Hidden in each level, there's also a super secret special car. These were always a joy to find and super fun to use. Well, the quad being an exception. I don't know, it's just way too slippery for my liking, and I don't really like the monorail either. However, I don't think anyone would disagree with just how iconic the rocket car is. What the fuck is this? The following day, Bart's trying to score a copy of Bonestorm 2, and after narrowly avoiding a journey for the windscreen, <laughs> finds out some crazy lady has destroyed all the remaining copies. But not to worry, comic book guy informs Bart that Professor Frink has bought the remaining copies, so he can scalp them on eBay. His new invention slash monster, the Trichosaurus, runs on the power of video game violence. <laughs> well, here's some extra juice for you, Frank. Ow, that is my elbow. He also needs a World War II radio, a satellite, and a blender. Now that Frank's got everything he needs, it's time to see the Trichosaurus in action. Here's what I'd like to say. There's too many people using their cell phones, which would cause the Trichosaurus to malfunction and kill many people. Dude! Bro! F off! I'm playing Angry Birds! Bart murders four innocent people. I like to smash. So now it's Truckosaurus time, son. Turns out it's like a truck slash dinosaur. I you never would have guessed. guessed. It promptly begins attacking Bart, so he speeds off and nearly gets torched on the way out. And then suddenly, out of fucking nowhere, a UFO flies above him and rips big ass, resulting in Bart fading out of existence. And you're telling me nobody saw this? Not even one of those random lobotomy NPCs? In terms of story, this really was a nothing level until the last cutscene. Weapons of Mass Delinquency has literally nothing to do with anything. However, it's actually one of my personal favourite missions to try and go fast in. Also, don't feel bad if you failed the nerd race a few times. The nerd car is programmed to go about 180 kilometers, but to even it out, he's meant to crash into a lot of things. The problem is, he rarely ever does that! He truly is the biggest nerd if he can outsmart his own programming. So it seems that the wasp that was buzzing around Trichosaurus caused it to go haywire. What's with these wasps anyway? Well, according to Bart, nobody knows why these things have turned up all over Springfield. They always seem to turn up whenever something exciting happens. There's 20 of the bloody things in each level, and I'm pretty sure they're the only thing that can directly damage you in this game. When you get close to them, they'll start getting real pissed off. Like a real wasp. And when they've charged their stinger, they'll zap you, causing you to lose some coins. Yeah, like a real wasp. You can deal with them easily enough with a simple kick, or if you want to be fancy about it, you can drive into them, and they'll drop around 20 coins. In later levels, they gain shields and fly all over the damn place. Sometimes they'll even phase through walls. Yeah, thanks, dick! Wasps aren't the only way of obtaining coins, however. In fact, pretty much everything will yield at least one coin if you hit it hard enough. Trees, fire hydrants, fucking birds? How the fuck are you gonna hide coins in a bird? I can think of a couple of ways. I'd always be overjoyed when I found a Buzz Cola box or vending machine. These are sprinkled around each level and there just aren't words to describe the unhealthy pleasure and satisfaction I take in destroying a bunch of these and sucking up all the coins like an oversensitive vacuum. You can use all the coins you've gathered to purchase a plethora of cars and outfits. 
some of which are required in order to beat the game. Amazingly enough, there are actually enough coins in the game to buy everything, so if you're planning on 100% in the game, you'll either need to grind boxes, or you can try your hand at a few wager races hosted by Louie from the mob. For a fee, you can enter a race around the map, and if you beat it in time, you'll double your money. They're not really worth doing if you need the cash, but trying to beat your best time can be quite fun. Alternatively, you can drive around destroying everything in sight. Be careful though, if you break enough shit, the gauge around your map will fill up. This basically acts as your wanted meter, and if you fill it, you'll get a hit and run. Oh crikey, it's the roses. If you get caught, you'll have to pay a whopping fine of 50 bucks. The cops genuinely used to put me on edge as a kid. As soon as you heard that music, you knew you were fucked. They're not so bad now, they're usually more of an annoyance than a threat, as they could be easily avoided if you learn how their AI works. <laughs> Thankfully, their AI is thick as pig shit. <laughs> oh, did you see that jerk? Level 3, this time we're playing as Lisa. Come on, come on, where's the cheat to skip this level? Oh, I'm kidding. I'd actually go as far to say this is my favourite map in the game. I love the aesthetic of this area, the summer vibes it gives off, the way this sign's misspelled, and the exploration I feel is at its best here. Lisa's on the search for Bart after he... well, you know... <laughs> gathering various clues from different folk around Springfield about where he may be. Everyone either has pretty sketchy information or just flat out lies to Lisa for their own gain. Nobody knows where the little bastard is! Lisa believes that his disappearance is the result of a government conspiracy, but we know that's not the case as we saw Bart being abducted, so all this conspiracy stuff comes off as a bit pointless. Eventually, Captain McAllister finally informs Lisa that he's sitting atop the sea spanker. However, not all is well with Bart as he's speaking complete and utter gibberish. <laughs> Lisa also points out that he's crapped his pants. That's just lovely. Level 3 can be a bit frustrating story-wise, with nearly everything leading to a dead end, but the missions in this level can be quite fun, such as Operation Hellfish, Slithery Sleuthing, or Clueless. Clueless was one of my favourite missions to speedrun, as your driving had to be impeccable in order to get enough coins for the run. I appreciate that this is also the only level where the bonus mission actually ties into the story of the level as well. Alongside the main missions, each level has one bonus mission, and you'll earn a car and a good boy sticker for completing it. In Lisa's case, she asks Skinner to help search for Bart, and Skinner is obviously pretty stoked that Bart's missing, but he says that he'll help with the search after he gets his chores done. With his mother, of course. And god damn, does Agnes absolutely roast this poor sod! This is a worse car wreck than your love life! Yes, mother. Inside Comic Book Guy's store, you'll find a ticket to the unreleased Itchy and Scratchy episode, 500 Yard Gash, which you'll only trade for a complete set of collector cards. Collector cards? Hello, Nighthawk. No, he's not talking about Pokemon cards, he's referring to the collector cards that are hidden in each level. These are a pretty neat addition to the game. Each card is a nod to an old gag in Simpsons history, and they usually relate to the character you're playing as. You can view your collection and the context behind them in the pause menu, along with the episode they came from. Although I don't remember the episode being called Homer at Bat. You know, I've always wanted to own a real set of these things. Or at least a replica coin. Back in the residential area of Springfield, crap circles are starting to appear in the shape of Bart's face, and Marge being very concerned over the gibberish that Bart's spouting, takes it upon herself to investigate. First things first, Marge is f***ing bad in this game. She chases down a donut truck and a redneck, races Chief Wiggum, rids the town of Buzz Cola, and blows up three, yes, three trucks. And she does it in style. The conspiracy really starts to get unearthed here. Marge talks with Abe about crap circles, revealing he once saw one that looked exactly like the Buzz Cola logo. When she shows it to Bart, he snaps out of his Ooga Booga talk, and reveals that the aliens are using it to brainwash the town. So Marge does what Marge does best, and blows shit up. I find it rather funny that after doing all this and avoiding the cops, she just goes back home to put her feet up. What's the best way to lose the cops? You may say a high-speed chase or a shootout, but... No. <laughs> no, just go home. Everything starts ramping up in level 4, the story really starts to get going, the sandbox is slightly bigger with the includes on Mr. Burns' mansion to explore, and the missions start to get harder and more involved. While nothing infuriating, this f***ing jump in ketchup logic was always so fickle. Sometimes you get it, but most of the time it's like, yeah, nah, mate, f*** you, you missed me by a pixel. Do the mission again! After many years of consideration, I think I can confidently say that Wolf Stole My Pills is my favourite mission in this game. You have to retrieve Grandpa's medication after the local hooligan stole them from him, and unfortunately for Marge, Nelson traded them to a guy in a black sedan for some play dudes. Check it out, man. This one's got an interview with the guy who invented the Wawa pedal. <laughs> Once you've retrieved the meds, escaped from another sedan, given Grandpa the meds, then given Grandpa some truckers' choice because his meds made him fall asleep, he can finally tell her all about the Nazi raccoon. Oh, I mean the crap circles. Crap circles. While the objectives in this mission aren't anything mind-blowing, the thing that makes this mission my favourite is the music. Wolf Star My Pills is such an amazing track. It's so fitting for this point in the game. It's mysterious, it's urgent, and it's a f***ing bop! And that goes for basically the entire soundtrack. 
This game has absolutely no reason to go this hard, but it did anyway, and the world is all the better for it. I've got a lot of favorites, like Petty Theft Homer, Barton Frink, Better Than Beef. Yeah, really, that banjo is pure bliss. Operation Hellfish, obviously Wolf Stole My Pills, Never Trust a Snake, Milking the Pigs, Kangan Kodo Strike Back, Long Black Probes, and of course, The Simpsons Hotline. These tracks make for great driving music. I mean, have you ever tried driving to Homer's Day? A lot of tracks take inspiration from other songs, like Operation Hellfish is clearly inspired by Riding on the Wind by Judas Priest. Long Black Probe sounds an awfully lot like the theme from the 1970s show UFO. Milking the Pigs is Hell's Bells by ACDC with that iconic bell toll. And Pay Theft Homer is deadass just the Flintstones theme. Anyway, I'm pretty sure Marge lives inside my boy Raj. I don't have any pockets. <laughs> <laughs> now this is out of left field. A poo is our protagonist for level 5. You know, I always thought it was going to be Maggie next, driving around in a pram or something. Now that Marge has brought Pooh into the conspiracy, he takes it upon himself to track down the source of the buzz color. Otherwise, he'll be reincarnated as a sea cucumber. Or worse, a land cucumber. <laughs> he tails a cola shipment, leading him to the mob, but ultimately requires the help of a hardened criminal to gather information on who exactly is driving the cola trucks. Oh, what good luck, a criminal! He recruits the help of Snake, who agrees to give him answers if Pooh helps him with Snake's community service and his charity work. Threatening Snake with profanity... <laughs> you wouldn't f in dare. Snake informs Apu that the cola trucks are registered to the museum, but oh no, his car is out of gas! Mine too. Thankfully, Bart is there to lend a hand. Presumably, he was also snooping around trying to find answers. Inside the museum, Bart's reflection has a mind of its own, and some buzz cola is shown dripping from a meteorite, which somehow brings a T-Rex skeleton to life. What? Backing away in fear, Bart trips on a power cord, resulting in the meteorite exploding and the T-Rex to fall apart. What? While snooping around, Bart and Apu stumble upon Kang and Kodos, who unknowingly reveal they've been filming the residents of Springfield with the WASP cameras for their hit galactic show, Foolish Earthlings. I knew there was a simple explanation. Their evil plan is to taint the water supply with Buzz Cola. I like it. Causing the town to go crazy. I like it. And to also provide the town with laser guns so everyone murders each other, causing big space ratings for Foolish Earthlings. This level can be quite challenging. It's certainly far more difficult than level 4. The first four missions aren't too much trouble, but Never Trust a Snake would be the bane of my existence as a kid. I can never seem to get an efficient route down to beat it in time. However, in terms of speedrunning, this level f***ing SUCKS! There's so many little things in this level that can kill your run. None worse than the baby van. This mission is entirely luck-based. For some reason, its AI is really screwy. Sometimes it will drive perfectly, and other times it will have what's known as wonky driving, where its handling will become super sensitive and it will swerve all over the damn place, making it rather difficult to get all the items needed efficiently. Well, at the very least, we have this. I never actually noticed until now that Apu doesn't actually have driving music. He just uses his music cues instead. I also never noticed how much of a chad Apu is in this game. He completely roasts everyone he talks to. Like, here he is after he wins a race. Is there a Mrs. Nahasa Pasa but whatever? Oh, thank the gods there is! <coughs> well, after that, I'm in need of a good laugh, and thankfully this game delivers. Mark with blue sparkles, there's gags plastered all over the place, and activating them plays a small little joke. Uh, there's not else much to say, really, but I'm obliged to mention them as they're required for 100% completion. Now that Bart and Apu know the full extent of the conspiracy, it's up to them to stop it. Well, Bart at the very least. It seems that Apu is pretty freaked out over what he's uncovered, so he dips out ASAP. Bart needs a ride to Krusty Loo Studios to warn Krusty about the cola he's endorsed. Thankfully, Otto's there to drive him there instead. In typical fashion, Krusty isn't there. Krusty's not here, little homer. He's down at the squid port. So Bart races to the squid port to get to him before his limo picks him up, which is stupidly fast, by the way. Krusty, however, doesn't believe Bart, so he needs to find someone who can back him up, Frank. Frank informs Bart that the aliens have been hiding lasers in Duff trucks and at the Duff brewery. Grabbing one to use as evidence, Bart shows it to Krusty, and he finally believes Bart. It's too late, however, as Krusty has already set up three laser stands in the Squidport area. If you've managed to endure that hellscape of a mission, you'll be meeting Homer at Krusty Burger. Homer is pissed that the aliens have been messing with his duff, so as father and son, they race to the brewery before the Allens can escape. Eat ass, fold ass, fold eaters. Eat ass. Only to discover Kang and Kodos waiting for them. They explain that the color running through the water supply will wake the dead, and foolish Earthlings' ratings will rise! I like it. I mean, oh no, I hope their plan fails. <laughs> Who am I kidding? I like it. Well, that level was certainly a ramp in difficulty. While going to the loo, lab coat caper and full metal jackass aren't too difficult. Getting down with the clown, duffer me, duffer you, Kang and Kodo strike back and especially set to kill are massive jumps in difficulty. 
I wouldn't blame you for being caught off guard with the clown limo and chase sedan races, as they both drive unreasonably fast. Did you know that this game has a really weird rubber banding mechanic? Yeah, during a race, if you're in first, the AI car will drive faster, but if you've fallen behind, the AI car will drive faster! However, the one thing in this level that will absolutely just piss you off is the f***ing traffic. And that goes for the entire game. They're always swerving into you and can't decide which f***ing lane they want to drive in. Just pick one and stick to it, dickhead! Oh, and I can't forget about Set to Kill, can I? Set to Kill is often cited as the most difficult mission in this game, and for the most part, yeah, I agree, it can be pretty damn difficult on your first time round. It seems that everything in this mission is out to f*** you over. The entire population of Springfield is on the boardwalk tonight, making it stupidly easy for your hit and run meter to fill up. I really wish these stands weren't placed so idiotically. The godforsaken traffic that always crashes into you, sending you flying across the map. This bullshit thing, and the supervillain car must be made out of f***ing paper or something. It's so brittle, and once you get all the stands, you've got 50 seconds to drive all the way back. I actually thought this mission was impossible as a kid, because the timings on this thing is so tight. But honestly, it's not all that hard of a mission if you know some neat tricks and shortcuts. See this? F*** that way, it's slow. Instead, try driving into the C-SPAN room resetting your car. You're welcome in advance. You can get an extra 4 seconds to get back if you leave this stand till last, and if you find that you're constantly getting hit and run, you can flick your camera back to reset what's in front of you. This is especially helpful while racing through the boardwalk. <sighs> And after all that, we can finally move on to level 7, the final level of the game. It takes place on Halloween, and if you were paying close attention to the newspapers on the loading screens, you'd have noticed that the game was leading up to this moment. There's zombies and ghosts and skeletons and- OH MY GOD IS THAT A WITCH?! Okay, turn it off! Turn it off! This is WAY TOO SCARY! For real, this level genuinely scared me as a kid. Remember when this game was just a fun little game about a guy kicking the shit out of kids? I missed that. This level can be legitimately eerie at times. The way the camera twists and turns, the horrifying sounds of ghost children at the playground. <laughs> fucking burning willy? That one can especially go fuck itself. A lot has changed since Kang and Kodos arrived. Other than the living dead knocking about, all of Springfield has got a spooky makeover. As most zombie apocalypses start, level 7 begins with Homer gathering supplies for the Simpsons household by taking Ned's medical kit, Cletus's boards, and Moe's chainsaw. Oh, poor Moe. Ah, oh, my life stinks. Supplies have been gathered and delivered to his home, now Homer goes to investigate Kodos and Kang's alien plans. Noticing that they've parked their ship in a cool black car in a school zone, he questions Smelly Sam on how they could do such a heinous act. The black car is actually an advanced alien probe, so he follows it to its destination, the power plant. The power plant? But I'm bored of this level. Oh hey look, it's Frank. Are you still here? Frank informs Homer that the alien's weakness is actually harmless nuclear waste, and plans on letting the aliens take a sip of the tasty green goo. Get used to this, as you'll be doing it a whole lot more. I'm not 100% on this, but it's implied that Frank actually dies from doing this. Although he clearly falls out of his car, presumably shattering his spine in the process. So now that Homer knows their weakness, he's in desperate need for more toxic waste. Not sure where to turn, Lisa suggests talking to Mr. Burns, which Homer does after avoiding another alien probe sent by Kang and Kodos. There aren't many on-foot missions in this game, however this mission exemplifies how limited you are in terms of platforming with a climb up to Burns' office. It's very easy for you to miss your jumps and plummet back to square one. After a slight bit of racism, Burns agrees to let Homer use his waste, and for the next three missions you collect waste and get the aliens to slurp it up with the help of Snake and Grandpa. Along with Set to Kill, the Alien Autotopsy Trilogy are often regarded as the most difficult missions in this game, and I can totally understand why. These three missions were the bane of my existence when I first played. Transporting the waste from the plant to the school doesn't sound too difficult in theory, but consider the following. Oh yeah, the waste can blow up. And it will blow up! Just when you think you've made it, Personally, I'm a firm believer that Autotopsy Parts 1 and 2 aren't really that bad. They give you generous time limits, and as long as you take your time and drive carefully, you'll be alright. But Autotopsy Part 3? Yeah, f*** it! The race against the probe isn't too bad if you know the right shortcuts, and you should know this level fairly well by now, but holy sh**! The World War II rocket car is so f***ing slippery, and it's so goddamn fast! You're practically guaranteed to spin out at some point, especially if you bounce off something, which is very easy to do, as these coffins love to get in your way. Depending on how good your driving skills are, you may do the race on your first try, or your 20th. So as you're frantically trying to get back in time, you're probably running over every kid and zombie on the street and hitting every object in your path, and your hit and run meter is guaranteed to be pretty high from the race, so you've most definitely got a hit and run by now, and... There it is. This mission will also make you realise that these characters never shut the f up. They're always spouting some bollocks about their feet or something. Ooh, the vibrations tickling my feet. Ooh, the vibrations tickling my feet. Ooh, the vibrations tickling my feet. I don't know what you're talking about. His feet. 
feet. I don't care about Homer's feet anymore. If you manage to actually get to the Simpsons house without, you know, the alien probe will be waiting there for you. So you'll have to avoid that thing, which can also catch you off guard, especially if you've got a hit and run. However, it's actually painfully simple to avoid. Just slow down, wait for it to turn, and then boom, there's your opening. After you lose the probe, it's really straightforward from there. Just get to the school, shove the waist into the UFO's UF ass, and beat the game. Well, it should be that simple, shouldn't it, Tyler? No! Are you fucking kidding me? No! What's happening? What is happening? Hey! Fuck you, dude! Aw, oh, I love you too. With one final barrel of waste, the alien ship is destroyed, crashing into the school and killing Kang Kodos and Grandpa in the process, thanks to the power of harmless nuclear waste! Later, the Simpsons family congratulate Homer on stopping the alien invasion, which he thought was a bad dream after eating too many raw hot dogs. Ah, that's a nice nod to the level 1 newspaper. With Kang and Kodos' death, the ratings for Foolish Earthlings have skyrocketed, and fans from all over the galaxy have come to basically worship Homer. For some reason, Kang and Kodos are in Earth Heaven, but thank God they don't have to sit for the stupid video game credits. No! So, what's left? Uh, well, got the bonus game. This little minigame is just a top-down racer which can play with up to three friends. There are seven different courses which you can unlock by collecting the collector cards I mentioned earlier. Like most top-down races, I'm absolutely terrible at it, but you can change the camera angle to be a bit more familiar. It's not terribly exciting, but it's a neat little distraction, and it's pretty cool to see these bite-sized versions of the levels. And that is The Simpsons Hit and Run. And if it isn't already obvious, I like it. And if it wasn't already obvious, I absolutely love this game. Yeah, it's got its fair share of issues, but I constantly find myself coming back to this game time and time again. Because it's just so much fucking fun! As a long-time Simpsons fan, this game is basically my wet dream with all the references and callbacks to the show's golden years. And I've only grown to appreciate it all the more as the years have went on. While the story isn't some grand masterpiece, it goes all over the place and knows exactly what it is and doesn't take itself too seriously. And it has enough substance there to keep the player engaged, even if levels 1 and 2 don't really mean much in the grand scheme of things. But you're not playing this game for the story, you're playing it to mess around and fuck shit up! Which is thankfully incredibly fun to do, especially with cheats. Blowing up everything in your path with a jumping fire truck is way more fun than it should be. And it's a great way to grind for coins if you don't feel shame. And you can always try a drunk mode if you want to feel like an alcoholic. I'm not sure if this was done intentionally, but it's kind of neat how the locations and set pieces get slightly more obscure the further you progress for the game. Like in level 1 you've got the ones that everybody knows about. The Simpsons house, the power plant, the quickie mart, the school. But then in level 3 you've got the slightly deeper cuts like the androids dungeon, the laboratory, the squid port and Camp Krusty. An underappreciated aspect of this game I feel goes often overlooked is just how well crafted the sound design is for this game. Getting into a car crash is f***ing brutal. See in most games when you crash it sounds like this. But in hit and run when you crash it sounds like this. You really feel the weight of it like god damn there's definitely some broken bones in that wreck. The difficulty curve is all over the place. It starts off fine but then it's like To have an easier time it really pays to get familiar with the driving mechanics. A lot of difficulty stems purely just from bad driving. It can definitely take a bit of getting used to, but once you get good, it'll make your time with this game a whole lot easier. A real point of contention for a lot of people is this game's art style and overall presentation. Characters talk like puppets during dialogue, flapping their mouths with barely any animation, with those unending thousand yard stares. I quite like it myself. I completely acknowledge that it looks like shit, but it has a certain charm to it that I just can't explain. You know, nostalgia. Although I can definitely understand why people would prefer the more cel-shaded look that Road Rage and The Simpsons game went with. The Simpsons game looks more, well, like The Simpsons, with its flat, boring colours but amazing 2D cutscenes, but Hit and Run looks better as a game with its more varied textures and horrifying 3D cutscenes. And hey, if you'd prefer Hit and Run to have a more cel-shaded art style, you can do that with a little tinkering. The lack of mission variation can definitely get fatiguing once you've done your 50th tailing mission. However, I appreciate that they do try and spice it up by adding multiple objectives within the missions, so you're not constantly doing the same thing. Although having to drive between the plant and the schoolyard six times in level 7 can get very tiring. It's like this level was rushed or something. Well, yeah, it was. Originally, level 7 was going to be a lot more involved, with the rich side of town being accessible as well as the power plant and a larger variety of missions. Hell, in the game's files, there's unused folders for levels 8 and 9, suggesting there was possibly going to be a total of 9 levels. Ah, that's okay though, all that content can go into the sequel! Oh! Wait! There wasn't a sequel, was there? Okay, I should probably elaborate a little bit more on why I don't think we'll be seeing a Hit and Run 2 or a remake. 
So I'm no lawyer, but the hit and run license is all tied up between Radical, Vivendi, Activision, Sierra, Fox Interactive, and the Simpsons license. That alone should spell bad trouble. I can't even find who actually owns the hit and run license. Presumably it's Activision, considering they ate up Radical and Vivendi. So while Activision may possibly own the hit and run license, EA currently owns the Simpsons IP for video games, and they definitely wouldn't let Activision release a game under the Simpsons license. Okay, so why can Activision just sell the hit and run license to EA? HA! But what if they did? Well, why on earth would you want EA of all companies to produce it? And EA themselves seem disinterested in making anything Simpsons related that doesn't involve the word freemium. I mean, as of 2020, Tapped Out has raked in an estimated $200 million in revenue. Do you really think a hit and run sequel would make anywhere near that much? Along with the licensing issues, I can't see this game getting remastered for one very unfortunate reason. A poo. I don't want to go into it in this video, there's many other sources out there that will go far more in depth into it, but no matter your opinion on the Apu controversy, I'm sure you can agree it's a pretty hot topic, and I can't see any game studio wanting to deal with the backlash that would inevitably come with Apu's inclusion in the game. And you can't really just get rid of him, he's a pretty important part of the game. Even if the game did get remastered, I couldn't see it doing favourably well review-wise. Instead of being compared to GTA 3, it'd be compared to GTA 5 and Red Dead 2, and with the lacking diversity of missions and the relatively small maps, it would be absolutely lambasted. While the Spongebob remaster looked fairly good, <laughs> it didn't really fix any of the core issues the game originally had, and I think the same would be true for Hit and Run. And does the game really need a remake? Other than being able to play it on newer consoles, I don't think there's much of a reason to have it remade when you can play it perfectly fine on PC using the Lucas mod launcher. This handy little tool allows you to play the game on modern systems, and also gives you the tools to play the game in widescreen, fix various bugs with the game, and most importantly, allows you to install mods. The hit and run modding community is massive, with no mod being bigger than Donut Mod. A complete revamp of the base game, including a new story with new story missions, a bunch of new cars and costumes, new characters, even more places to explore and a plethora of new activities to do. If an official remake or sequel never comes out, this is the next best thing. It has pretty much everything I'd want to see in a sequel. Except for Mo with a shotgun. While Donut Mod 4 is the latest release, it's still very much in its infancy with only levels 1 and 2 being finished. But what's here is already really good so I'm looking forward to when level 3 is released. My only real gripe is the UI, it's just way too flat for my liking, like look at the radar, that looks boring as f**k. I much prefer the UI that the Simpsons Hit and Run Return, a fan made remake is going for. There are a load of other cool mods too, like this one where you can actually play as Mo. They did it, they actually went and did it, they created my perfect sequel. Oh wait, you can't use a shotgun. Never mind, it f**king sucks. There's also the Steamed Hams mod, which is literally just a mission where you play for the Steamed Hams scene. Okay, f**k donut mod, this is the hit and run sequel we need. Yeah. Along with the modding scene, the speedrun community is also super active. I've met some amazing people through it. My mate Sadly Bally ran it at SGDQ back in 2018 and it quickly became a fan favourite run. Check it out if you have the time. And if you thought Marge's voice was bad, wait until you hear French Marge. Trust me, I'd absolutely love to be wrong on all of this. Obviously I'd love to see a sequel come out at some point. Or maybe a spiritual successor? Simpsons kicking asphalt anyone? If a sequel were to ever come out, I'd love to see like a big massive open map of all of Springfield, more cars, more missions, more characters, more f pretty much well, more everything. Just give me more hit and run please. I just want more. It'd also be really cool to see some like online play like GTA Online. One can dream, right? So have you played The Simpsons Hit and Run? If so, what did you think? Is it one of your childhood classics or do you prefer The Simpsons game or Road Rage? Let me know below, I'd love to have a discussion about it. Uh, stay back, freak! You're not real! See you in hell, skateboarding. <laughs>